talking to you today about um, the U visa, which is a form of um, a victim-based immigration relief that I will explain in more detail as we go further on with the paper. I'm going to start with an anecdote that comes um, basically from my diary from when I was working as a, um, a legal advocate at a community um, a, a immigrant advocacy organization in the D.C. area. Um, and I will be talking about an instance of rape, but I won't be going graphically into that. So, thank you. Um, I tried calling the police station again after they ignored our request to sign the certification, attesting to the fact that Sarah had been gang raped by four men, and that she collaborated with the police in the search for the suspects. I'd grown accustomed to these daily calls, surprised when the secretary said she'd put me through to the detective after weeks of telling me he was out to lunch or in a meeting. The detective spoke to me in earnest. He would not sign the certification. Why would she get into a car with four men she didn't know? Why would she drink the beer they offered her? Why was she not more shaken after the incident? I gleaned from the detective's line of questioning that he believed that Sarah had perhaps not been explicit enough in her refusal of the men's advances. Perhaps the rape did not involve as much force as she claimed. Perhaps, he assumed, the fact that she was audacious enough to enter a car with four strange men and drink the beer with them signaled to a character so lascivious that such acts were common and thus incapable of, of invoking significant emotional hardship in the victim. I reminded the detective that in signing the certification, he was not attesting to the degree of hardship the victim suffered as a result of the crime. The determination of significant hardship was to be made by immigration. His signature only confirmed that she suffered a qualifying crime and that she was helpful to the police in the effort to locate the perpetrator. Her story is just not credible, he said, and he refused to sign. The U visa, established under the Victims of Trafficking and Violence Protection Act of 2000, provides a path to legalization for immigrant victims of crime. Eligibility requires victimization or witnessing of a limited set of crimes, full collaboration with law enforcement and the prosecution of the perpetrator, and what I want to examine here, the suffering of, quote, significant hardship as a result of the crime, um, and also obtaining the uh, U visa certification from local law enforcement, which is what I was referring to in the opening anecdote. So the first kind of step is getting the certification either from this, the police department that had jurisdiction over the crime or the state's attorney. Um, throughout my three years as community organizer and legal advocate for undocumented survivors of sexual and domestic assault, I met dozens of the thousands of women who each year, like Sarah, apply for U visas based on the suffering of domestic or sexual abuse. I observed that victims often felt the need to narrate stories in a way that conformed to Western, westernized heteronormative notions of gendered moral behavior. Many women felt the need to justify in great detail why they stopped going to church, why they kept returning to abusive spouses. Others felt that they, need to ra they needed to rationalize the circumstances that brought them to mother several children with different fathers. I give this talk at a moment of transition, ending several years of work as a practitioner throughout which I formulated the questions I now seek to address as an activist scholar, beginning my PhD. My presentation thus serves to flesh out a series of hypotheses rather than arguments designed to prove a central thesis. I use this paper as an opportunity to bring together literature that will inform the ethnographic work I'll undertake over the next several years. I inquire about the problematic nature of requiring U visa applicants to demonstrate significant hardship as a result of their victimization. I suggest that the significant hardship requirement is not directly relevant to Congress's stated aims in creating the U visa, and I take issue with the notion that individual hardship could somehow be measured against an, an ambiguous standard. Further, I seek to analyze the ways in which applicants resist their construction as flattened, defenseless, and saintly subjects, amenable to nationalistic rescue fantasies, by formulating their own identities, and to use Teresa de Loretta's term to formulate those identities in excess of the patriarchal gaze of the state. I don't know why it's that color, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> So demonstrating significant hardship as a result, uh, as a direct result of a crime is a unique facet of the U visa application process that does not appear to be directly related to, object, to Congress's stated objectives uh, that they outlined when they created the U visa. So I have two quotes up here, um, one directly from the VTVPA legislation and the other from the Department of Homeland Security stating the, the objective of Congress. 
in, in creating this, this visa. Um, so reading these, it's a, it, one can note that the objective of the U visa is to encourage undocumented immigrants to report crimes and to enhance law enforcement's ability to apprehend criminals who commit crimes against undocumented immigrants. In furnishing evidence that they were a victim of a qualifying crime, they reasonably collaborated with law, and law enforcement. Does the survivor not establish that she has contributed to Congress's stated objectives? I suspect that the degree of intimacy and in the details victims must provide in order to establish significant hardship allows adjudicators to distinguish those applicants who might be formed into more obedient or desirable immigrant subjects from those who prove to be more problematic. One of the most important elements of the U visa application is a lengthy declaration written by the applicant and usually with the help of a legal advocate in which the victim must describe in minute detail the incidents of abuse they experience. Legal advocates and applicants spend hours working on these documents, fine-tuning the details of the narrative, and thus obliging victims to repeatedly recount dramatic details of their abuse. Applicants may never meet face-to-face -face with officials who adjudicate their applications, yet the process of putting the most intimate details of one's life, the degradation experienced in the bedroom, the choice to risk your life to protect your children, the insecurity, the pain, the regret, to put all of that into a lengthy document to be read by an anonymous official, starkly resemble Foucault's notion of the examination. Foucault's examination is an instrument of disciplinary power in which examiners render the subject visible so, so as to be able to position them in, in a hierarchy with other surveilled subjects. As Foucault states, it's through this, quote, normalizing gaze that it becomes possible to qualify, to classify, and to punish, end quote. And you can't see that, can you? That's okay, I will give you the numbers. Um, so as I've outlined, um, I suspect that the significant hardship requirement functions as a mode of surveillance. The number of people applying for U visas has driven drastically since USCIS began accepting applicants uh, 15 years ago. In fiscal year 2009, USCIS received 6,835 U visa petitions. By 2014, it had received over 26,000. Yet Congress has maintained the cap on the number of U visas at 10,000 a year. USCIS is thus under an immense, USCIS being uh, the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. They're under an intense amount of pressure to establish mechanisms by which they can determine which victims are most deserving of relief. Yet how does one exactly measure hardship and deservingness? The notion that individual hardship can be measured against an ambiguous standard is inherently problematic. Indeterminate legal concepts like significant hardship or good moral character abound in immigration law. Such vagueness gives the immigration legal framework a reputation for being legislatively chaotic and inconsistent. Sarah Lacani argues that even, quote, when, even when rules and provisions of immigration laws are fairly straightforward, they frequently force adjudicators to exercise discretion in, bro in applying broadly worded statutory or regulatory language to individualized fact. Miriam Tickton's work on the humanitarian politics of care will be instructive as I move forward. I will look to Tickton's notion of, quote, the ahistorical victim outside time and place, outside history and politics, as I try to understand how USCIS identifies deserving victimhood. My future work will also seek to analyze if and how the applicant's race plays into adjudicators' determinations of hardship. Laura Hengehold writes that definitions of rape across time and space are ambiguous and whether or not varied authorities qualify certain acts as rape is contingent on the intersectional subjectivities of the victims themselves. The notion that determinations of criminality are reflections of the assumed credibility of the victim leads me to wonder whether racialized stereotypes about female sexuality figure into adjudicators' measurements of hardship. For example, mass media representations and political discourses portray Latinas within Ansaldúa's Puta Virgen Academy in which Leo Chavez writes that they are characterized as, quote, either hypersexualized and hot seductresses or pure virginal girl girls. If Sarah had been a white woman instead of a Latina, would she have experienced fewer or different attacks on her credibility? I also want to question how significant hardship functions to produce what Sarah Lacani calls clean victims. It is common knowledge in the world of immigration legal practitioners that past unscrupulous behavior even if that behavior is completely irrelevant to the crime in question, destabilizes the credibility of the victim's claims. 
The assumption the detective from the opening anecdote made was that because Sarah was irresponsible enough to get into a car with four men she didn't know and to drink the beer they offered her, the claim that she in no way consented to sex somehow appears less plausible. I also wonder whether USCIS officials and law enforcement officers' investment in portraying U visa recipients as defenseless and saintly is symptomatic of an understanding of migration to be a flight from tradition into the arms of modernity. I align my project with Gruel and Kaplan's call to take up new kinds of study of migration that, quote, trouble the narratives of movement from pressure, oppression to freedom, end quote. Building upon scholarship that has problematized the rescue narratives that characterize other forms of humanitarian immigration relief, I ask in what way the presence of the significant hardship requirement in the U visa signals to the, to the presence of colonial rescue fantasies in which, to use Spivak's famous phrase, famous phrase White men save brown women from brown men. Finally, I consider the means through which applicants exercise agency in making their life stories legible to anonymous adjudicators. How do survivors demand that adjudicators understand that the calculus of their decision making made perfect sense within the unique and harrowing circumstances in which they found themselves? Sadia Hartman's discussion of Harriet Jacobs' A Perilous Passage in the Slave Girl's Life allows me to think through how women who find themselves in the midst of inhumanity operate within a framework of rationality that may appear irrational to others. Jacobs, a slave raped repeatedly by her master, forces her readers to understand that in the context of utter brutality, feigning compliance to the master's advances felt like something akin to freedom. During US slavery, the law did not consider the rape of slave women to be a punishable crime. Assumptions about, about black lasciviousness made the notion that a black woman re would resist a white man's advances unthinkable. However, Jacobs demands that her readers understand that submission should not be mistaken for consent. When you live in a world in which you are not considered to be fully human, simulating consent, consent emerges as the least degrading of all the options you might choose. These decisions, write Hart, writes Hartman, are, quote, intelligible only within the scope of laws that reduce you to the condition of chattel. How do U visa applicants follow Harriet Jacobs' lead in demanding that others understand that the decisions that they make are perfectly rational within the circumstances of their lives? How do they push back against the pressures they face from their advocates and anonymous officials to render themselves legible within a framework of rationality formulated by individuals whose lives are incomparable to their own? My objective in writing this piece has been to theorize three years of observations about a unique mode of immigration relief that allows undocumented victims to seek justice against their assailants and potentially to gain legal status in the United States. The creation of the U visa constituted a positive step towards a more humane migration system and continues to be a life-changing opportunity for thousands of people. Engaging in femi feminist theorists as well as scholars of immigration, I have attempted to demonstrate, however, that the existence of the significant hardship requirement is problematic in several ways. I am excited to see how these ideas that I've discussed ab ab above evolve as I conduct my field research and learn more about women applying for U visas. Thank you.